pretty excited here today because we're finally behind the wheel of a Lexus. This is something that's been on our list for a couple years now because it was also on our list of things to buy before we got the 7 Series. Our spotlight is on this 1998 Lexus GS400. It's got a 300 horsepower V8, which is something that was demanded from the American market. Now, you could have gotten the inline six GS300, but this is the range chopper. So we're gonna be showing you everything about this car, going in depth and going over what you need to know if you're in the market for this mid-size luxury car. Before we dive right into the second generation GS400, I want to assure everybody that the owner of this car has kept it as OEM as they come, adding an aftermarket exhaust and a TRD strut bar from the Japanese market Toyota Aristo. The current black hood is temporary, as the vehicle was recently involved in a front end incident, so that will be repainted and fixed back to its original Cinnabar Pearl factory paint. Up front, we find the factory bi xenon headlights, yellow fog lights, and headlight washers, which were available in Canada, but not in the US. Out back, we find the aftermarket exhaust, original rear spoiler, and those unique Lexus taillights. As mentioned in the intro, the 1UZ FE 4 liter Toyota engine produces 300 horsepower and 310 foot pounds of torque. That's 10 more than the 540i M Sport we filmed, and 25 more than the comparable Mercedes E430. Moving to the inside, this car is finished in the same beige leather that the 1997 Lexus HPS or High Performance Sedan Concept was finished in, and has held up incredibly well for having driven over 208,000 kilometers. While the interior might not meet everybody's definition of luxury, we found it to be really well designed. The steering wheel sports only two buttons on either side of the horn, the down button up front and up behind which control the manual shift mode for the transmission. The left stock controls the lights, including the automatic headlights and front fogs. On the right, the intermittent wipers without an automatic feature. Below that is the cruise control setting with a traditional key-based ignition found on the dashboard. To the left of the steering wheel is the instrument cluster brightness dial and the theft deterrent system status light, followed by the power mirror controls and the Canadian spec headlight washer system. Further down is the parking brake release, fuel door, and trunk release with a trunk lock in the middle. The gauge cluster is straightforward, with the tack and speedometers large and bright. There's no cluster computer for open doors or fault codes, just regular warning lights and a digital trip computer. At the top of the center dash is the hazard switch, digital clock, center air vents, and automatic dual zone climate control. The auto button at the top right controls fresh airflow and features a sensor which can automatically change the air to recirculation if the air outside isn't clean. The Nakamichi audio system sounds pretty good for a 20-year-old car, but Toyota ditched them in 2001 for Samsung's Harman-owned Mark Levinson audio system. The controls are straightforward with little explanation required. The easy-to-access tone controls are convenient and don't really feel out of place. The center console certainly feels like a Toyota, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. Everything is designed with a purpose and placed where it needs to be for maximum functionality. The cigarette lighter and ashtray hide under the audio controls while the cup holders are covered beside the automatic gear shifter. Just in front of the armrest is the ECT button for the electronic throttle control system, PWR for sport mode, snow for better traction on slippery roads. The front heated seat controls are in the center and the vehicle skid control on the right. Above the center we find the power moonroof controls, map and interior light switches, and the home link buttons. The button on the rear view mirror cycles the auto dim feature. When the light is on, the system is in auto mode. Front seat controls are pretty easy to figure out with the seat bottom, back, and lumbar running from front to back. Along the driver's door are two memory seat buttons along with the central locking button and window switches. All four windows are automatic up and down, including control from the rear passenger seats. The windows can also be opened or closed from the key by using the lock on the driver's door. Toyota put some serious thought into the back seats of this car. The seats are ridiculously comfortable, especially when you compare them to the E39 5 Series and W210 E Class. I was able to sit comfortably behind the driver's seat with plenty of room for a mid sized car. Each rear door is finished with leather and wood, sports their respective automatic window switch, and an ashtray. You wouldn't know this is a 20 year old car. 
Um, it, it doesn't even look like a 20 year old car, especially with the, the spoiler at the back. And uh, really, I like the paint job, this nice red. You really wouldn't know that this is a 20 year old car, but it is. And with that V8, I think we're gonna have quite a bit of fun driving up. There's a 540, we just saw. 540, which is kind of what competed directly with this, uh, both for the age. I mean, that was probably like a 98. So year for year it was the same, but if you were really considering a 540, then the GS400 is one to consider too. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of power. I'm surprised from a, basically from a Toyota. Jeez, it's not like raw, instant, blistering speed like this M3 here, but wow, I'm surprised. 300 horsepower in a car that's you know relatively big. It's not a full-size, mid-size car, 300 horsepower. That's pretty good. It's got like a pretty good sound to it too with the aftermarket exhaust. So one of the other things we, we were kind of talking off camera about is the interior. Um, it's, it's very well laid out. It makes sense, right? You've got everything within arm reach. You've got your controls on the side for the windows. You know, your radio and everything here is where it would be expected. The buttons are nice and big too, right? So, I mean, the average customer age of like 75 can easily read <laughs> all the buttons, but it's really well laid out. I mean, you don't need it to be overly complicated and sometimes less is more. And if you're just trying to flap your paddle mode out here, which is a little different, you know, usually you've got paddles, but the buttons, well, they certainly work. There's a bit of a, a delay. And we've noticed that even with newer luxury sport cars that the, you know, it's automated transmission, right? So it doesn't, doesn't shift exactly, but I do kind of like having that there, especially if you were, you know, I don't know if you would take this to the track, but if you're going to be driving it around like this, like it certainly works uh, pretty well. You can throw it down and downshifting seems to be quick. Upshifting is a little bit of a delay, but it's automatic. Oh yeah. <laughs> Can't really go too far though with this, but listen to that sound it's only at 4,000 rpm but there you go you can feel and you can probably see it in the camera too though it is kind of when you hit a bump there is quite a bit of shake to it so it's not as smooth as a lot of the other cars newer cars though compared to what we've done in this category at this age point it's pretty similar now we are clearly doing the speed limit here so you can get an idea of what this car is capable of oh it sounds great though i'm sure all these people are loving the sound too as we're driving by their house doing exactly the speed limit and not a kilometer over Whee! oh yeah i feel like i'm in japan it's where they tested it on the toge track never thought i'd be driving around ripping the shit out of a lexus but here i am and it's quite fun oh we've got to take that corner nice and tight like that. this should be a racetrack right here forza's forza eight be doing the Bromont Express. As is the case with the cars we feature on Test Drive, the 2GS, or second generation Lexus GS, has an active enthusiast community online. Forums like clublexus.com are great resources for new owners to learn more about their vehicle. As for common problems with this car, there isn't much. The lower ball joints appear to be a common weak point across all the second gen GS models, but replacement seems to be a pretty straightforward process and the caster or control arm number two can cause front end vibrations at highway speeds. Other things such as the dashboard and sunroof rattle can develop over time, and the timing belt needs to be serviced every 140,000 kilometers. These are common problems, not common maintenance. The key to keeping an old luxury car on the road is to perform maintenance when it's required by the service intervals. When researching this car, I found thread after thread that discusses how owners are driving well into the 500,000 kilometer mark with their original engine and transmissions because they do the maintenance when it's required, not when something goes wrong.
Lexus produced three different engines and models throughout the seven-year Canadian production run. The GS300 with the naturally aspirated 2JZGE inline six, this GS400 with the 1UZFE V8, and an update in 2001 which brought the GS430 and the updated 3UZFE 4.3 liter V8. The interiors were mostly the same throughout the years, with options like wood steering wheels, full wood shift knobs, and 17-inch rims being popular selections for customers. Since this is a Japanese car, that means there's tons of JDM options not available in North America that people desperately want, like power folding mirrors or that twin turbo inline six motor from the Toyota Supra. These cars are also popular with the VIP community, which is when you take a car like this and add an insane amount of luxuries, typically to the rear seats, like a fridge, curtains on the windows, pillows on the seats, and many others. This also tends to go hand in hand with the stance community, where slamming the car equals VIP. No matter what you want to do with your 2GS, it'll likely last longer than you'd expect it to. You may not be blown away by a car like this, but it's interesting to look at what Toyota was doing back in the 90s and early 2000s with the Lexus brand, because it helped push BMW and Mercedes to compete against a new rival. Thanks for watching this episode of Test Drive Spotlight on the 1998 Lexus GS400. As always, if you have any questions about this car, please leave a comment below and don't forget to like the video if you've enjoyed it. Subscribe to our channel if you haven't done so and visit our communities online at Facebook, Twitter, or follow me on Instagram at Niall Livesey. Until next time, take care. Oh, you're in the middle of the road. Quick rip. <laughs> yeah, it takes a second though. Once you click that button, it's like, second and a half delay, but...